beyond belief. Fact or fiction? Hosted by Jonathan Frakes. Tonight, your challenge is to separate what is true from what is false. Five stories, some real, some fake. Can you judge which are fact and which are fiction? To find out, you must enter a world of both truth and deception, a world that is beyond belief. We've all seen paintings that seem to follow us as we move around the room. But what do you make of a painting that changes as we move around it? This is a picture of a cityscape. Look at it straight on, and you see the fronts of the building. But move around it, and the sides of the building come into view. How is this possible? The ingenious artist painted this picture on a canvas with ridges. So as you move, your perspective constantly changes. So be aware that while you may view our stories tonight in one way, much like this picture, your perspective may suddenly change. Sound confusing? Don't worry. You'll get the picture. The accessories of a courtroom. Sometimes cameras are allowed in to record the proceedings. And when cameras are not permitted, a courtroom artist sketches the participants. But can any artist or camera capture absolute truth in the courtroom? For even under oath, only witnesses know the truth of their own testimony. Matt Richmond is a lawyer who cares about the truth. He'll fight for any client, rich or poor, as long as he's convinced of their innocence. And concerning his latest case, in a few moments, he's about to get the true picture. Three months ago, I was hired by Lloyd Corbeil as his defense attorney in a capital murder case. Corbeil was accused of brutally stabbing his young wife, Corinne, to death. What do you think? I don't know. I couldn't read it. Have faith. I liked Corbeil from the first day I met him. He had an easy charm that was hard to resist. The prosecution presented a strong case of a jealous husband who murdered his wife in a fit of rage. Corbeil swore he was asleep in the bedroom when his wife Corinne was surprised by an intruder who viciously stabbed her to death. Corinne's parents, Doug and Beverly Weeks, came to the trial every day. They were certain Corbeil was guilty. I was certain he was innocent. Madam Forewoman, has the jury reached a verdict? Yes, we have, Your Honor. Will the defendant please rise? The jury had only been out for two days. I was worried. How do you find the defendant on the single count of murder in the first degree? We, the jury, find the defendant, Lloyd Russell Corbeil, not guilty. Oh, my God. I did it. We did it. Mr. Corbeil, you are free to go. I want to thank the ladies and gentlemen of the jury for all their hard work in a very difficult case. This court is dismissed. You're a genius, Counselor. No, you saved yourself, Lloyd. It was that story you told them on the stand. That's what turned them. The pen story. Yeah. About how this was the last gift my dear Corinne had given me. And how I would cherish it for the rest of my life. I saw the jury's faces. You moved them all. It was obvious that you loved her very much. Did it really come across? Because I didn't love that slut, not one bit. What did you say? Corinne was sleeping with everybody in town. I knew she was. I could feel it. I could see it on her face. I could smell it on her clothes. 
I got a confession to make, Counselor. There was no intruder. I killed Corinne. It'll be our little secret. Oh, in case you're thinking about talking, just remember, double jeopardy. I can't be tried again. I don't believe this. Well, I'll believe it. I want you to have this. To remember me by. Along with that fat check you're gonna get. You're a genius. I couldn't think straight. What had I done? Here he comes. Corbeil. Mr. Corbeil, Please. Please. Mr. Corbeil what are your plans now? Well, this has been a very trying ordeal for me and for Corinne's parents. I want you all to think about this. The real killer is still out there somewhere. And I'll be offering a reward for his capture. But for now, I would truly appreciate it if you all would just give me a bit of time to try and get my life back together and to do some grieving in private. Thank you. Mr. Corbeil, just one Mr. more question. It made me sick inside to know that Corinne's parents were in so much pain and Corbeil was walking away a free man. And then, for some reason, I suddenly remembered the pen. It disgusted me to touch it. I didn't want it anywhere near me. All I could think about was getting it back to him. Corbeil? Yeah. I don't want your pen. I don't want anything of yours. Well, suit yourself, Counselor. You just passed up a $1,500 pen. Yeah, well, you keep it. You're going to need it to get the devil's autograph. <laughs> the devil's autograph. The devil's autograph. That's, that's funny. Oh, 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 oh. was the strangest thing I'd ever seen. Somehow in the fall, the pen had penetrated his chest and pierced his heart. Lloyd Corbeil was dead. What caused the elevator to malfunction at that particular time? It had never done that before or after. And how do you explain the pen being the instrument of Lloyd Corbeil's death? Were the fates at play here or was it mere happenstance? Should our writers be praised for transcribing the truth, or are they guilty of artistic perjury? We'll find out if this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, see what kind of curse can make your hair and teeth fall out on Beyond Belief, fact or fiction. Have you checked the back sections of newspapers and magazines lately? You'll find you can become anything from a dental assistant to a minister by simply purchasing a degree through the mail. And like all such offers, some are more legitimate than others. Charlie Lunt has been making a good living from offering illegitimate degrees through the mail. But his dirty little scheme is about to unravel. And he'll soon discover that these worthless certificates may include something Charlie never bargained for, a curse. Hello, I'm Charles Lunt, president and founder of NTTA the National Technical Trading Academy. In just three short weeks, you'll become a highly paid and sought after computer technician at a cost for the entire course of only $999.95. You have my guarantee that an NTTA diploma will get you a high paying job in computer electronics. Computer electronics? Or I'll personally refund your money. Oh, I love you, Charlie. Con artist Charlie Lunt has put together a lot of scams in his day. But this current one is his most successful yet. 10,000 victory is sweet. Mm. Yeah. Good week, huh, Mr. Lunt? Oh, not bad, but we can still do better. Send out that new batch of diplomas? They went out this morning. Mm, good girl. Oh, you got some more letters. They're all from people demanding their money back. They say they couldn't find any work. Gee, really, that's too bad. But you can't always bet a thousand, Janine. Just leave them here, I'll take care of them. 
Yes, sir. Don't hold your breaths. Oh, I'm gonna rock your world. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Lund. Who are you? I am one of your students. How'd you find me? I mean, uh, what's the problem? Didn't you uh, get your diploma? I received my diploma, but I never found a job like you promised. I looked for six months, but nobody would hire me. I wrote to you for a refund, but you never answered. I have a family, and I have no money. I want my refund, Mr. Lund. Look, I never promised how long it would take to get a job, so technically, I don't owe you anything. And it'll hold up in court. You are a fake a fraud, and I want hey, my money. Get your hands off me. Hey, security! I want my I refund. I don't owe you anything. Get your hands off me. You want my refund. I want to arrested for trespassing and assault. Do me, sir! Better the hand, you! Yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks for the buck, creep. Over the next month, Charlie's mail order scam boomed. His only problem was where to hide all the cash. He didn't want to use a bank because he wasn't planning on reporting any of the money. Charlie solved his problem by having the wall behind the steel bookcase hollowed out. Charlie loved having his money right behind him so he could count it whenever he wanted to. But then something strange began to happen. Well, you've got 10 more checks and 15 more letters asking for refunds. My God, Mr. Lunt, what's wrong? You don't look so good. I'm feeling awful lately. Can't keep anything down. I'm nauseous all the time. We barely got out of bed this morning. Well, maybe you should see a doctor. I've already been to a doctor. Said he couldn't find anything wrong. It's probably just the flu. That's what it is, it's the flu. <laughs> it was frightening to hear the doctors had no answers, especially for a man who was so vain about his appearance. Mr. Lunt, did you have a good weekend? Got the morning mail. There's a bunch of checks. That should cheer you up. Are you feeling better? Wow, that's a lot of money. Mr. Lunt? I'm Charles Lunt, president of the Mr. Lunt? Mr. Lunt, are you all right? Charlie Lunt hollowed out the wall behind it. He didn't know that he was removing the lead shield that protected his office from the radiology x-ray lab located next door. The green glow of his money was enhanced by repeated doses of radiation.
Was Charlie's demise really the fulfillment of a curse? Or was it only the result of the radiation coming through the wall next door? And what made him choose to hide his money in the hollow wall? He had been in that office for years, yet never chose to do that until after the curse. Is this story of the man who peddled phony diplomas a lie? Or does it contain a degree of truth? We'll find out if this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, a mysterious publication changes the life of a teenage boy on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. The Corner Newsstand. Even with all the information that's available on the internet, TV, and radio these days, it's still a special place as color, sounds of the city, other things to excite your senses. I read this one for the articles. The fact is, you can find a variety of things at a stand like this, but young Vinny Rose is about to find something he needs more than anything in the world, a mentor. died when I was 11. I've been scavenging out in the street ever since. It was hard, but I had no place else to go. The streets are a tough place to live when you're only 15. I was born into a rough life. My dad was a bad drunk. I don't remember much about him, but he beat me with his belt. He ran out with me and my mom when I was only three. All he left behind was a lot of bills and a belt buckle with his initials on it. DR for Don Rose. Oh, man. I wear the belt buckle to remind me never to trust nobody. I didn't have any friends or any future. I didn't really care. I just wanted to get my cans and get out of there before those guys came back. That's when I found it. The old magazine was in perfect condition. I figured it must have been worth something. you give me for this? Pretty good condition. You steal it? No. I found it in a dumpster, I swear. I'll give you 10 bucks. 20. And that hoagie sandwich you got sitting over there. Got a deal. Never seen you around here before. Uh, where do you live? All over. How'd you end up homeless? Mr. Can I have my money? Sure. What's your name? Vinny. You got parents? It's my mom and she's dead. I was through wasting my time with this guy. But there was something about him I kind of liked. Hey, hey, kid. I can use some help around here. So? So I'm offering you a job. Well, what's the catch? Catch. Got to work. Doc gave me some money, told me to get some new clothes and clean myself up. Then he taught me all about running a newsstand. How to make change, how to order stock, have a good day. and how some things have a value you can't put a price on. Fuck. That's not for sale. He was better to me than anyone I'd ever known. After a while, I got so good at what I was doing, Doc actually left me in charge. He'd take off for a couple hours every few days. He said he had some business he had to take care of. He never told me what it was. Put 
come back. For what back? You're stealing cigarettes. Hear that? He's calling me a thief. You believe that? Look, just put the cigarettes back and I won't call the cops. You know what look cool on you? Let him go! Let him go! What are you gonna do about it all? Let him go! Dude's crazy! Let's get out of here! Oh, I'm sorry, Doc. I, I'm sorry I let you down. Don't worry, you, you did fine. You okay? Well, I'll go clean that up. The next day, Doc left again. I was glad he still trusted me to run things. This time, a week went by and I still hadn't heard from him. I was worried, but I didn't know who to call or how to find him. Are you Vincent Rose? Yeah, why? I'm Doc's attorney, Addison Montgomery. I'm afraid I have bad news for you. What? Where's Doc? Doc was diagnosed with a brain tumor six months ago. He, uh, he died yesterday during surgery. He, uh, he asked me to give you this, in case he didn't make it. He was a good man. Dear Vinny, when I first saw you, I knew who you were right away. You were wearing my belt buckle, and I'm ashamed to say it's the same one I used to hit you with when I got drunk. I'm your father. What I did a long time ago was very wrong. Now, I want to do what's right. The key in this envelope is to a safe deposit box at First Monument Bank. Inside is the deed to the newsstand and $50,000. Everything I had in this world is now yours. I love you, son, and I'm sorry I had to leave you again. Don, Doc Rose, your dad. Remember this magazine? It's the one that brought Doc and Vinny together. Where did it come from? How could a magazine from 1939, founded in Alley, still be in such pristine condition? Did Doc know that Vinny was in the area and plant the magazine for him to find? If so, how could he be sure Vinny would bring the magazine back to him? Is this touching tale of a father-son reunited based on truth, or is it as false as the headlines of a phony tabloid? We'll find out if this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, a killer is on the loose in a graveyard on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. Have you ever walked through a graveyard? It could be a strange and foreboding place, especially when the sky is overcast and the wind swirls around the grave sites. Michelle Lambert and Stacy Gilmore are at the cemetery this day to work on a school project, and the chill in the air they're about to feel is due to more than the sudden change in the weather. It was the time of year when the weather gets unpredictable, but my girlfriend Stacy and I were given a predictable assignment for history class. We had to trace the family trees of our prominent local citizens. This meant long, cold days spent at the local cemetery. I'm ready for a break. Do you mind? I told you to eat more at lunch. Well, I wasn't expecting to be here all day. Is there such a thing as cemetery-itis? <sighs> Amazing, isn't it? That no matter who these people were in their lives, no matter how important, they all ended up in the same place. After all the time we've spent researching this stupid report, I feel like we've ended up here. Oh my god, what was that? I... I don't know, a car backfire? 
I don't think there's a road on that side of the cemetery. Well, what else could it be? That's weird. What? That guy. I suppose he worked here. It's nobody I've seen before. Oh, forget about him. He's not even your type. Meaning what? Look, that was a gunshot. He's got a gun. You're kidding, right? No, I'm not, and he's headed this way. Quick, over here! See what he was shooting at behind those trees. <gasps> Did you hear something? No, come on now. Let them know Roy Hennessy was killed by Jerry Fletcher. Tell them that. We gotta get to the car. I left my cell phone there. Come on, we've gotta call the police! He staggered toward us. He was holding his stomach and there was blood on his shirt. He fell down on his knees, and, and then he said, let them know Roy Hennessy was killed by Jerry Fletcher. Tell them that. Tell them. Those were the man's exact words, and the exact names he told you. You're sure? Yes. Positive. Believe me, there's not one detail of this I'll ever be able to forget. God knows I'm going to try. Detective Tanner? Is that it? Yeah, the knapsack and things like they said. But there's no sign of a body. Anywhere. That doesn't make any sense. Maybe we were wrong. Maybe he wasn't dead. He, he could have crawled away. Look, you'll have to check the whole cemetery. It isn't exactly that I don't believe you. What about the man with the gun? The, the long hair? He ran right past us. We didn't make this up. Why isn't somebody out there looking for this Jerry Fletcher guy? Are we done here, sir? Radio Sergeant Morgan. He's making a transfer from downtown to the county lockup. I want him to swing by here. Yes, sir. This way, please. Stay there. Yes, that's the man we saw. That's the one. Absolutely no question. That is amazing. You've already got him in custody. You guys are so fast. It's Fletcher, right? What is it? I'm afraid there's a couple problems with your story. It's not a story. It's what happened. First, the man you said who died, Roy Hennessy, was shot and killed in the cemetery. So what's the problem? It was two years ago. Well, then Fletcher shot somebody here two hours ago. That is Fletcher, right? Man in the patrol car is, in fact, Jerry Fletcher. He was picked up after you botched an armed robbery. But you couldn't have seen him here. He's been held in police custody for 72 hours. So I don't know what to tell you, ladies. Well, then who shot Roy Hennessy? The case has never been solved. You did it. We know you did it. Tell them. Tell them. Michelle. Michelle, come on. We did what we could do. Let's just forget about it. Let's 
go by forensics. Just for the hell of it, I want to run a test on Fletcher's gun from the robbery. <clears throat> you're, uh, you're thinking there's a match to that old murder based on this? I know, I know. The results of the test on Jerry Fletcher's handgun showed it was the same weapon that had been used in the shooting of Roy Hennessy. When he was told about the evidence, Jerry Fletcher confessed to the murder that he had committed two years before. What did Michelle and Stacy really see? Did they witness the original murder in some unexplainable time warp? Or perhaps some locals who knew the story were playing a prank on the two girls. But then how do you explain the identity of the man in the police car? Is this bizarre story of the cemetery based on fact? Or have our writers toiled too long on the graveyard shift? We'll find out if this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, a helpless old woman encounters two strange drifters on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. The romance of the trail. The notion of the grizzled cowboys riding into the sunset. It's always meant heroic freedom to most Americans, but not everyone in the Old West lived an adventurous life. A good many of them, like Zerelda Hart, struggled to get by, barely making ends meet. She lives alone in her tiny cabin, sometimes not seeing another soul for weeks at a time, until one fateful night. The year was 1870, and Zerelda Hart had been living alone ever since the passing of her husband, Cleveland. Zerelda's cabin was located in the remote hills of northern Missouri. It had been a hard and lonely life for Zerelda, but she remained a charitable and decent person. Zerelda's nearest neighbors were over 40 miles away. She seldom had visitors, especially on a cold, rainy night. Boys are soaked to the bone. Yes, we are, man. We've been riding for a long time. We'd truly appreciate it if you might come in and set for a spell by your fire. Oh, please do. Come right on in. Get yourselves out of the cold. You all alone here, ma'am? Yes, I am. My husband, Cleveland, took sick and died two years ago. Don't you have no kids to help you out? No, we never had children. It was just Cleveland and myself. Oh, that's too bad. It's tough being a woman all alone. Especially way out here in the middle of nowhere. My name's Zerelda. Zerelda Hart. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, ma'am. What you doing there, ma'am? These were Cleveland's. Get yourselves out of those wet clothes before you catch your death of cold. They might not fit you very well, but at least they're dry. Thank you kindly. You can keep them. I have no use for them anymore. I bet you're hungry. Well, you've been kind enough, ma'am. We don't want you to go to any more trouble now. I sure could stand to eat something, though. I got some soup on the stove. You sure are nice. She kind of reminds me of Ma. Your brothers? No, ma'am. He means his mom. Oh. Zarella couldn't quite figure out the two strangers. She wondered who they were and why they seemed so secretive. So where are you boys headed? Home. You've been away for a spell? A spell? How about you? How long have you lived in this place? 20 years. 
ever since Cleveland built it. We've had a lot of happy days here. My memories are all good. What's wrong? We never had much money. But after Cleveland passed, things got really bad. And I had to borrow $900 from the Davis Savings Bank in Gallatin just to get by. I put up the house and land as collateral. Well, now that note has come due. And tomorrow someone is coming from the bank to collect. I have no way to pay it. I'm going to lose my hope. Where will you go? you with this. There's nothing anybody can do. Why don't you get some sleep? And I'll get up and fix you breakfast in the morning. When Zerelda got up the next morning, the only thing on her mind was the foreclosure of her home. She was sorry to see that the two strangers were gone. She never even found out who they were. And then she saw it. Left on her table were nine $100 bills, along with a note. Dear Miss Serralda, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thought you could use this. Make sure you ask the banker for a receipt. Several hours later, the man from the bank arrived with the foreclosure papers, ready to be signed. Mrs. Arelda Hart, J.T. Burnham from the Davis Savings Bank. I've been expecting you. J.T. Burnham was a man who was trained in counting money. There was no doubt that he was holding $900 in his hand. Burnham couldn't understand how Zerelda Hart could pay the entire amount that she owed the bank. He found it equally odd that it was all in $100 bills. But the thing that really surprised him was when she insisted on a receipt. He reluctantly gave her one, but was puzzled as to why she made such a point of it. Hand over your money sack now. I have no money. All right, all right, don't shoot. You boys are gonna get into a lot of trouble for doing this. They're gonna put a price on your head. We already got a price on our heads. You can tell your friends, you were just robbed by Frank and Jesse James. Jesse and Frank James really play the part of Robin Hood for Zerelda Hart? It's hard to imagine, but the plight of the helpless old lady may have actually touched the cold stone hearts of the West's most notorious outlaws. In presenting this piece of cowboy lore, have we given you a tale based on fact? Or did the truth just go that way? Next, you'll find out which of our stories are facts and which are fiction when Beyond Belief returns. Now let's look back at tonight's stories and find out 
which ones are inspired by actual events and which ones are totally false. What about the criminal who used a pen to write a death sentence? Corbeil? Yeah. I don't want your pen. I don't want anything of yours. Well, suit yourself, Counselor. You just passed up a $1,500 pen. Yeah, well, you keep it. You're gonna need it to get the devil's autograph. <laughs> devil's autograph. The law books are filled with bizarre tales of people who met with strange ends after their trial. Was this one? Yes. An event like this happened to a lawyer from upstate New York in the 70s. Let's review the story of the mail order swindler who cheated everything but death. I want him arrested for trespassing and assault. Do me, sir! Bitch the hunt, you! Yeah, yeah. And thanks for the buck, creep. Is it possible this story is true? Yes, it is. A similar story occurred outside New York City in the late 80s. How about the story of the father and son who were reunited at the corner newsstand. Hey, mister! What do you want? How much you give me for this? Pretty good condition, you steal it? No, I found it in a dumpster, I swear. I'll give you 10 bucks. 20. Was this story based on a real happening? Not this time, our writers made it up. And what was your opinion of the two girls who just witnessed a murder in the cemetery? A murder that took place two years before. Okay, that was a gunshot. Where's that guy? He's got a gun. And he's headed this way. <sighs> Quick, over here. Was this story inspired by an actual event? Yes. Our research found a published report of a similar story. Let's review the story of the good deed performed by Frank and Jesse James. Hand over your money, Seth, now. I have no money. All right, all right, don't shoot. You boys are gonna get into a lot of trouble for doing this. They're gonna put a price on your head. We already got a price on our heads. You can tell your friends you were just robbed by Frank and Jesse James. Can it be this story is fact? Yes, it is. The event was reported as having taken place in the Ozark foothills in 1870. So do you still think that fact and fiction are polar opposites? Or do they occupy the exact same space? And trying to find one without encountering the other is a challenge that is truly beyond belief. I'm Jonathan Frakes. The stories entitled Devil's Autograph and Mail Order Degree are true based upon first-hand research conducted by author Robert Traylons. This is Campbell Lane.